welcome everybody. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. okay well, welcome to this um, rather special seminar of the Development Studies Department here at SARS. Um, and as you know, uh, the seminar is serving as the vehicle of a book launch um, for the new book by my former colleague and pal, Matteo Rizzo. And this is the book, Taken for a Ride. I'm just going to say a few words about the book. Then I'm going to invite Matteo to talk about aspects of the book for up to 40 minutes. And then the discussion will start with another comrade who's here, Alana Dave, from the International <coughs> Transport Workers Federation. And then I hope we'll get some good uh, questions and discussion going. Um, some years ago, I can't remember how many, Matteo will, I got to know Matteo when he came to the Development Studies Department at SOAS as a postdoc fellow. He'd done his PhD in African history here, and <coughs> I don't know, could we say you were a kind of refugee from the history <laughs> department coming into Development Studies? And two things I remember clearly from that time are one, that uh, under the terms of his fellowship, Matteo's responsibility or commitment was to write up and publish articles based on his PhD. But the other one I remember very clearly was his great uh, interest in and enthusiasm for the transport workers of Dar es Salaam, because he had already done, was it a bachelor's? He's already been in Dar es Salaam and got to know a lot about um, those, uh, those workers on the buses there. And now, some years later, the book has appeared and I'm very happy that it has and I have just finished rereading it because earlier I'd read drafts of it, parts of it, and rereading it as a whole um, has demonstrated to me, reminded me of what an excellent piece of work it is. Now I won't go into that very much because uh, Matteo will be talking about it, but it uh, very unusually combines a number of distinctive strengths it seems to me. One is, it, it, it's the whole thing is built on a fantastic ethnography and this has a, a, owes a lot to Matteo's command of Kiswahili and his enjoyment, I think, of hanging out in Dar es Salaam at bus stops, uh, at various popular points in the city, um, popular in the, the classic sense of where the people meet and, and go about their lives. Um, another reason I like the book so much is that I think it has a splendid <coughs> critique of a, a particular and perverse kind of populism, which is where the championing of the informal in sec uh, sector by people like Fernando de Soto and this very strong and unfortunate current post-colonial, post-structuralist writing on African cities and the lives of, of the urban poor converge. It's a very peculiar uh, and, and in some ways disturbing uh, train of ideology which I think uh, Matteo nails down so well and so precisely uh, in this book. And you're going to talk about, that's one of the things you're talking about. Good. Um, I also very much like the uh, the title he's taken, with all its metaphorical uh, possibilities taken for a ride, which he uses very well uh, throughout the book. <coughs> and in the conclusion, there's a very nice summary of, uh, as Matteo calls it, using this metaphor, six stops along the route that the bus or, or the journey takes. And as he says, and I think it's again, for me, is, is part of the great strength of the book. Two of those stops were unexpected when he first encountered 
these bus workers in, in, in Dar es Salaam. One of those stops was when they organized themselves collectively. And this leads Matteo in the book to propose and to illustrate, I think, very, very well, a very a finely drawn dialectic between issues of agency and structure, a more general issue in the social sciences, and I would say particularly collective agency, because the, 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 um, the kind of De Soto informal economy advocacy, of course, champions individual agency in a peculiar form, but Matteo traces connects and analyzes this collective agency. So that was one stop. The other stop, I suppose, is the last stop, which perhaps Alana will talk about a bit, which is that um, with the more recent field work that um, Matteo did to complete the study, um, historical moment had now moved into what's called second phase neoliberalism. And this was a grandiose project, or took the form of a grandiose project, by the World Bank to introduce a BRT, Bus Rapid Transit, uh, system <coughs> in Dar es Salaam. And there's a really interesting and subtle account of how that proceeded, or failed to proceed, according to the vision or fantasy of its, of its designers. And I think that's also, and that, that's something for those of you here who are development studies students, I think, together with the critique I mentioned, uh, these are things in the book of, of much wider significance that you can learn from um, in thinking about other areas of, of development theory uh, and <coughs> practice and policy. Um, last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do the marketing, this beautiful edition, Oxford University Press, it is a beautiful edition actually in terms of the printing, the print design, it's beautifully written. This is available for you to buy. Maybe. Oh, well we hope it will be um, <coughs> afterwards at half the publisher's price. Should be outside, uh, so <coughs> make sure that you, you go <coughs> take advantage of that offer at the end. And in addition, Matteo will sign it with half his name. Right? So, <laughs> half the price. <laughs> so if he's feeling good at the end of the session, he'll sign it with his full name. So, welcome again, Paragunis. They say in Kiswahili, and over to Matteo. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Henry, for your very warm introduction. And it's a pleasure to have you and Alana here today. And, and so what you have in this book uh, is a fine-grained case study on public transport, precarious labor, and neoliberalism in Dar es Salaam, which uh, I hope, uh, upon reading, you might agree, can act as a micro-window to understand much broader processes that are taking place beyond Dar es Salaam, after all, the rolling back of the state, uh, the enforcement through uh, policy and lending conditionality of neoliberalism is the, the big story of the past 30 or 40 years in development studies. And this uh, a, a fine grain interdisciplinary political economy uh, that draw on uh, uh, quite slowly carried out fieldwork. So as Henry mentioned, this was my BA dissertation back in 98, then I used the same findings after an MSc in Development Studies as so as to write my MSc dissertation about this. Then uh, my PhD was not about transport, but I was still in Dar es Salaam, uh, where the archives, the national archives that I was using for my PhD in history were. And so uh, I was finishing or even cutting shorts these days in the archive to go and continue researching this topic and in particular uh, the reality of working in this sector. And then there was a, a career break from academia and when I rejoined in 2008, I resumed the fieldwork on this subject. 
and by then I had kids, so very much short visits. Uh, but you know, you have a field work that takes place in 2008, 2010, 11, 12, 14, until I said, okay, let's close it. Uh, so it's a case study about public transport, but I'm keen uh, to make the point that it's a case study that aims to engage with theory bottom up. And we are talking about uh, an African city, so the theory on African cities, the, 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 the huge, vastly growing uh, field of writing about uh, African cities and urbanization in the south, and the informal economy, because these are workers operating in, in, in informal settings. So these are the two bodies of work that uh, you directly will find an engagement with. And the, the first part of my presentation will be about uh, deconstructing and, in my opinion, destructing uh, two sets of uh, theories, approaches that have become really hegemonic when it comes to writing on the city and on the informal economy. Uh, these are the post-colonial narrative on African cities. And then the second one is uh, market fundamentalism, mainstream economics, you might call it in different ways, uh, theorization of uh, economic informality. So, Following this, I will trace what a more constructive and fertile way to study cities and labor is by illustrating the six stops that the book makes, which correspond to the chapters of the book. So to start, the, 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 the post-colonial narrative is all about rejecting the idea that when we study African and Asian cities, we get stuck with this understanding that are all about chaos, dystopia, about things that don't work. They contrast this with the reading of the urban experience that is all about hope and understanding that there is an order and functionality in these cities, but we need to open our eyes to the fact that it is unconventional and not Eurocentrically defined. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, constant clash between chaos and order, dystopia and hope, uh, is uh, at the present uh, uh, stuck in the moment of uh, uh, rising hope. You know, I think it's safe to say that post-colonial narratives, if you look at uh, publications coming out, position of power as editors in key academic journals, keynote speeches given at conferences are really quite hegemonic. Uh, and what I hope to do in the next five or ten minutes is uh, interrogate uh, what, what this narrative uh, about hope and uh, alternative functionality is about, understanding the theoretical implications, the empirics, which are very thin, but also the political agenda that derives from this. So postcolonial narratives tell us that we need to reject this normative, teleological, and Eurocentric reading of uh, cities in the south as dystopics. We need to move away from materialistic explanation of urban realities centered on economic failure. And we need to move beyond political economy and the developmentalism, which they explain as attention and obsession with different levels of development, if we are going to build uh, a more pluralistic and more fertile post-colonial, shall I add, urban theory. I'm going to put a few quotes so that we can share uh, uh, the, the details of the writing by these key authors. It, this is Simon, a very big guy in the field, that says, urban life should not be seen as a series of policies gone wrong. Agency and determination by urban Africans to find their own way is key to understanding urban society in Africa. Peter Sir, director of the uh, South African Center for Cities, complains that we locate slums with their teeming complexity in a black box devoid of complex agency and determinacy. Uh, there are very bold uh, statements that we should reflect upon about doing without attention to materiality. And this is the book who writes about Kinshasa and says, what one needs in order to, open, to turn an open space into a garage is not a building named garage, but rather the idea of a garage. So all that you need is ideas to be creative and exercise your agency. You might ask, where are the resources to access the building or, or the tools that you use in a garage come from? But this is not seen a concern. And Robinson, who is perhaps the most famous of all these guys, says that we should not understand cities in the south as dysfunctional. Every city is different. We are best understanding cities as ordinary. This is our key message. So to repeat, <coughs> African cities and functionality, if you follow this narrative, do not follow the North experience, but we need to understand their order and functionality nonetheless. 
This is not just an academic agenda, it comes with uh, uh, some claims to alternative politics that this different understanding sets up. These are the same guys that say the phenomenology and practices of the everyday must be the touchstones of radical imaginings and interventions. Our role as researchers committed to social sciences is to recuperate the constitutive humanity and by extension generative powers of the ordinary. As we are told that African cities are built on people as infrastructure, the policy form formulation of a better urban future must draw on such infrastructure. Robinson again refers to the transformative potential of shared lives in diverse contested ordinary cities. Uh, my questions as I read this uh, text, as you might have guessed, are quite convoluted as well and dense is to ask a set of uh, layman questions about these readings. And so I ask myself, what is the ordinary? What do people at the grassroots, or ordinary citizens, do every day when they get up in Africa? What do concepts such as people as infrastructure and generative powers really mean? If it's true that these powers are generative, from what sources do generative powers derive and what do they actually generate? To what extent are such generative powers or transformative potential able to make a dent on the poverty that we do know exists in these cities? And do such contribution have anything to say about how <coughs> poverty is created in first place in these cities? Can we think of radical interventions to improve the lives of people living in poverty without addressing the root or structural causes that created in first place? Is it true, and this is given as a given in these narratives, that political economies' analysis are by definition reductionist and prone to teleology? Or is that a caricature, and what are the costs of caricaturizing political economy like this? When we say that every city is ordinary, isn't this a form of extreme and misleading relativism? What does understanding the African urban experience in comparative terms entail? Are there other ways to think comparatively about African cities. As I apply these questions to this text, uh, I realize that we are dealing really with an incapacity to uh, move beyond the vague concepts. So this is uh, Achille Mbembe, another you know, very famous and important intellectual. They're writing about Johannesburg and they're responding to the criticism by Michael Watts, who is a political economist, about the fact that people as infrastructure doesn't really mean much. His response is that the difficulty with having to act through the provisionality that people as infrastructure implies is that the meanings of the tactics employed can hardly be pinned down. That might be true, but the point is if you look at this text and look where is the evidence or, or empirics behind these claims, uh, I wouldn't say that there is a significant field or effort before we give up by saying it's quite difficult to pin it down. Simone, again, along the same line, say innumerable possibilities of combination and interchange that preclude any definitive judgment of efficacy or impossibilities. To be sure, open-ended situation, fluidity, uncertainty, you don't know what will happen tomorrow. But as scholars, our job is to take a congregation of three, four million people and try to understand which of these open-ended situations takes place more often than others. And then we are moving towards an analysis of informality debates. What do people at grassroots or ordinary citizens do when they wake up in the morning every day in Africa? One thing we will agree with uh, uh, these post-colonial <coughs> scholars is that they do work in the informal economy. These are economies with very small formal uh, uh, sector sizes. And as a result, you survive by working in the informal <coughs> economy. So it becomes important to understand how this kind of scholars conceptualize informal economies. And the romance goes on. This is Simone saying informal economies might act as a platform for the creation of a very different kind of sustainable urban configuration from those currently generally seen. Peterson, again, says as long as the contemporary capitalist system persists, uneven and highly exclusionary, it is likely that it will serve the interests of the majority of the poor to retain their autonomy. Robinson, again, again, same key words, talks about citizens shaping an autonomous and inventive future. 
That is, uh, so the key words is here, informality as uh, uh, exclusion from capitalism, informality as a space of, of autonomy from capitalism, which leads me to the second theoretical entry point, which is uh, uh, the Soto or mainstream economics market fundamentalism. Uh, the Soto is famous, this quote is perhaps one of the most widely quoted <coughs> quotes in development studies, says the poor do not so much break the law as the law breaks them. He reads the explosion and mushrooming <coughs> of informal economic activities as the reaction from below people who want to tell governments who are over-regulating the economy that it's better to do without regulation. So informality is a choice, a collective choice by the poor against the state over-regulating the economy. And when we ask what type of workers do we find in the informal economy, uh, De Soto is again going very openly against the political economy analysis when he says that Marx would have been shocked to find out how in the informal economy you don't find oppressed legal wage workers, i.e. proletarians, but instead oppressed small entrepreneurs. So this narrative has been very powerful at projecting the idea that in the informal economy you're dealing with self-employment, people working for themselves in very small-scale business. Again, this is a conceptualization that uh, uh, has a very important policy relevance because from this idea of self-employment as the norm in the informal economy, you get uh, so much of investment of aid money <coughs> into microcredit, the formalization of property rights, a set of interventions that take as a starting point the idea that the poor are self-employed. And as I will go on to show, the problem is that these, uh, if this is the policy relevance of this analysis, the problem is that much of the policy that we see is irrelevant to the need and realities of poor people. So there are two different strands. They have the differences, but what they do share is a misleading notion of agency, a notion of agency that fails to be rooted in a, a, a grounded understanding of what the structure, both political and economic, a work are against which a, a wise reading of people's agency needs to be placed. And there is also a, a very misleading conceptualization of informality as a space of autonomy and exclusion when we know from existing literature that the reality or working in informal economy is to be incorporated in the most brutal form of capitalism you can find. Why am I saying the most brutal? Because there's no degree of regulation that might protect workers from employers. And so you have two sets of uh, uh, markets that poor people tend to be operating in. One is the, the, the small scale trading. You know, so many people in Africa operate in very small-scale trading, and the problem, of course, because the scale is small, these are oversupplied markets where the competition is really cut through. And the second one is an a, a oversupplied labor market, the dramatic situation of countries with no jobs, and people really uh, struggling to even get access to these jobs if they do exist in the informal economy. And that leads me to ask where does this dysfunction, you might call me normative, I still call dysfunctional, situation where there are no jobs comes from. And that's where we need to find a better way to understand urbanization in Africa in comparative terms. And the obvious starting point is to, to see how growth of cities in Africa and in much of Asia has not followed industrialization. And this lies behind the fact that there are no jobs. In some, attention to economic and political structure and to the historical paths that underpin this economic and political structure becomes essential to begin to appreciate what agency poor people might exercise in a less romantic fashion. So I take this uh, disagreement with these bodies of work and then I take it to Dar es Salaam where we are now moving and I my empirical efforts through fieldwork over the years were all rooted in applying to different aspects of this transport system uh, the quintessential radical political economy questions that I strip to the bone and ask uh, within public transport, who owns what in public transport? If you look at the buses, if you look at the roads, if you look at the station, who does what with what they own? You know, if you, 
if you ask who owns what, then the next question is, uh, what does it change in terms of the provision of public transport ownership of what? And finally, I ask, once I know who owns what and who does what with it, who has the power to exercise in the transport system so that the shape of the public transport system is influenced and what are the political struggles that underpin different efforts to exercise power. As Henry say, is a journey in six stops. Um, the first one is really a big picture, context. And this is uh, about setting the scene and understanding the transition from a private, a public provision of public transport to uh, private provision of public transport. So here you have a deregulation, uh, economic liberalization. And uh, the two ism concepts that are central to make sense of this transition uh, are neoliberalism and post-socialism. Neoliberalism is central because you do see how uh, details of the transition in Dar es Salaam conform to a bigger picture that takes place in all other African cities and more broadly in the direction of policymaker that is about rolling back the state, uh, opening up uh, services to uh, private sector provision, and in the case of Tanzania, since the early 90s, progressively removing the state even from a regulatory framework. So if you look at the mid-90s, uh, public provision was operated, was provided by private operators without any control on fare levels or, or any control on the number of entrants in the sector. And this has uh, very negative implications on the quality of the service because basically the provision of public transport is reduced to a kind of a Formula One racing where an oversupplied market with many mini buses are competing uh, in ways that really uh, violate the, the most basic rules of uh, safety uh, in public transport. The second concept, as I was telling, to understand the shape of public transport is post-socialism, because this pervasive deregulation leads to transport chaos, and this creates legitimacy problems for the government, who is constantly called to comment and to intervene to improve the public transport, the problems of which are before the very eyes of the public, constantly debated in newspapers, which I use a lot in the book to make sense of what's going on. And post-socialism is about saying that we need, it was developed as, a, as an idea by Anne Pitcher when it comes to African studies, and, and she's complaining about the fact that when we study Africa, we don't pay enough attention about the legacies of socialism and the way in which people who try to resist liberalization but also people who try to justify their political existence following liberalization draw on notions, ideas, concepts of the socialist era, even in the context of uh, uh, pervasive liberalization. And post-socialism is important because time and again you see the public sector, the state, intervening in public transport matters in Dar es Salaam, trying to justify these interventions as a way to uh, reclaim some public ownership of the provision of public transport. But, however, these are interventions that are undermined by the lack of capacity of the state that doesn't have the resources or the means to address the, the huge problems that the provision of public transport is experiencing. Stop two unpacks the private sector. So far we have uh, talked about the transition from public provision of public transport to private provision of public transport. In stop two, we ask again, who owns what, who does what in these private buses? And here, a worker is writing on the back, life is war. Uh, what, what war is it talking about? Um, a questionnaire was administered to uh, over 600 workers, and what I found out was uh, the importance of a class, because you have a clear-cut stratification where 90% of the workforce is operating buses that they don't own. So there is a class of people who own the buses and a class of 30,000 people that work on this, selling the labor to the owners. The problem and the, the, the war that the, the worker is talking about comes again from the nature of the labor market in Tanzania. This is the best uh, way to synthesize in four words, actually three, what it means to be a transport worker in Dar es Salaam. This guy is saying, which means bad job, comma, if you have one. 
So the idea that if you think that Dalla Dalla work is awful, the problem you face is that there are thousands of people behind you who are desperate to get the job that seems awful to you. And as you can imagine, this uh, oversupplied labor market has very important implications on the balance of power between bus owners and bus workers. Bus owners don't even wage workers and exploit them through wages. They ask for a fixed sum of money at the end of uh, each working day from the worker. On top of that, workers need to pay for petrol. They need to pay for bribing police if necessary. Whatever is left at the end of the working day will be their uh, return from work. As you can imagine, this sets uh, uh, the brutality of the working condition in the sector. You know, Dalla Dalla workers need to work 16 hours per day, 6.7 days per week. Uh, and uh, at the end of this uh, long working day, the income that we get, the daily return, is uncertain and not very uh, uh, substantive. Here is another one talking about money torture. And most importantly, when it comes to understanding why the provision of public transport by the private sector is so inefficient, clearly the roots of all the inefficiency of the private sector operations comes from unsolved employment problems. Why am I saying this? Because if you're going to work 16 hours per day, and the last one or two trips is the money that you take home, it means that speeding is a necessary strategy to survive in the labor market. You know, because the more you speed, the more trips you can complete every day. If you overload the, be the bus with passengers, you make more money for each trip. If you refuse to ferry students because they pay a bit less, you make more money for each trip. So the many inefficiencies of the public transport provision by the private sector are rooted in responses and reaction by workers to very exploitative uh, terms and conditions of employment. The second thing we do in this um, chapter is to look at statistics on labor because one problem that uh, was occurring is that I was, uh, I'm picking a story where labor and understanding of labor markets was central to understand the provision of public transport, but official statistics, as you can see, this is uh, the 2006 labor force surveys, tell that in the informal economy, paid employee wage workers are 0.7% while self-employment is a third combined 96%. So the question is, was I hallucinating or is there something uh, very wrong with the way statistics on labor are created in Tanzania but more broadly in developing countries? And what I did was to take the questions that inform labor force surveys to look at how status of employment, are you a wage worker paid employee or are you self-employed, are posed in English and then when I look at the Swahili translation, I was contrasting and comparing the way workers talk about their employment, the terms, the words they use, with the phrasing of these questions in Swahili. And what emerged from this story is a, a way of posing questions that makes for a worker to answer that is a wage employee impossible and force as a catch-all category respondents to suggest they are self-employed. So, <coughs> workers are very, you know, one aspect that was coming out from all the interviews is this feeling of deeper disappointment about being criminalized by the public, by employers as the main source of public transport problems. And workers are greedy, workers are hooligans, they don't have good manners, they don't respect our students. And the, the government is laying on this narrative of we need to clean public transport, we need to get rid of these hooligans. And the workers are uh, putting forward this disappointment. And the best one, again, a, a guy wrote, taking on this uh, narrative of cleaning public transport, he wrote, Kamakuoga ni usafi, kwanini tauli mechafuka. If to wash means to clean, why does the towel get dirty? So he's saying oh, this narrative of cleaning is, is, is nonsense. And so the question that came from this is why do 30,000 workers uh, occupying the same structural position, operating in a city that without their services would be brought to its knee, would be impossible to move around in the city, why did workers fail to organize, to express an institution that would represent their interests vis-a-vis -vis the state, vis-a-vis -vis employers? And what I found is that 
In the same way in which you need to open up the, the private sector, you also need to unpack this notion of what does it mean to be a, a Dalla Dalla workers. There are at least three categories of different Dalla Dalla workers with different role and stakes in the labor process. There are those who are given the bus from the employer. They work from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. This is physically impossible, so when it comes late morning, they take a break. Uh, they have a two-hour rest, and there is a worker on the bench who lost his previous job in a bus. He's going to take over for a couple of hours, get enough money to eat for a day, and just survive day by day like this. And then there is a third category, that is the job of those who fill the buses. Once the bus is full, by shouting the destination, they get one fee, one fare, and move to the other bus. Why does this matter? Because workers, at least what I could capture from interviews, on their mind was how to try to keep a foot in the labor market rather than thinking of taking on employers, the state. At the same time, at this stop, we look at what workers actually do, not, notwithstanding their failure to organize, to have an institution that represents employers, uh, them against employer or the state. And I studied uh, one informal institution that put together uh, this, uh, the transport workers of one route, and I located, uh, I tried to understand, first of all, how would they go about using the space to create a source of income that then creates an informal way welfare system? And the second thing is, how do they use this money? And this money is important for this worker to keep the head above water, because they use this uh, to smooth consumption. If you don't have money for food, if you have a family health expenditure which is serious, the, the party will support you, the association will support you. But they also use the money to bribe policemen if one of their colleagues is uh, impounded by the traffic police. So to romanticize uh, the, the everyday the, and the political implications of this, I think it would be impossible on the basis of what I did find. Stop number four was uh, dictated by events. I go back to, in 2008 to Dar es Salaam and I find that uh, workers have started uh, an association called the Wamada. You can see it on the, on the left. And they've been told that if they want to represent uh, workers in Tanzania, they need to become a branch of the transport trade union. So there is a partnership between this workers association and the transport trade union that develops. And I studied how did workers, what was the spark that led workers to organize, what was the relationship between the, the trade union and the informal workers association. Once the association was formally registered, what was the strategy to claim labor rights from employers and the state, and the substantive uh, gains that over nearly 10 years, these efforts to formalize the employment relations in transport uh, achieved. Stop number five is empirically the most difficult one because this Dalla Dalla worker is saying get rich or die trying and I often ask myself when researching this uh, topic that you can clearly see hardship, uh, it looks really grueling but what you don't know is whether this hardship is uh, fueling dynamics of slow micro accumulation and upward mobility or whether this is just hardship that serves to reproduce itself. And as you can imagine, when you're dealing with a, with a, with a, a sample that is 30,000 workers unregistered, you don't have a starting point to do this. But what I did was to use uh, the informal association that I was talking about records. They had a list of people who get access to the income of the association. So it's a roster that is closely monitored by every single member of the association. You can be comfortable that the, the people that 120 or so people that in 2001 were reported as transport workers genuinely were transport workers. So what I did is at two points in time, I asked to two different groups of workers what were the occupational whereabouts of uh, these groups. And the findings uh, are not pretty because you find that uh, 13 years from the first moment, 48%, uh, which is nearly half of this workforce, is stuck in this profession. 52% has moved to other jobs where you have two groups within this subgroup. 
the, the tragic stories of burn out characters, characters that descend into drug consumption, alcoholism, and uh, you know, one of my informants was stoned to death because he was found stealing from a house in one of the rich areas. So there is a significant amount of these workers who, after being squeezed like lemons, just burn out and end up in a bad way. And then uh, about half of this group moves to other jobs and they use the, the skills honed through Dalla Dalla work to move to other driving or mechanics related jobs. The taxi driver, the private chauffeur driver, the lorry driver, a couple of them, uh, they praise uh, the, 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 the fact that these are much less uh, hectic jobs if, uh, and as well more remunerative. Anyway, stepping back from this number, what is uh, important when we try to step out to Dar es Salaam and understand what the significance of this story is, that when I interviewed these workers in 98 and I was trying to ask, what were you doing before this job? What do you see your job? How long do you think you will do this job? It was described invariably as a, a Daladala work as a passing time job. You know, I, I just lost my job. I'm just doing this for now. It pays the bills, but this is not where I see myself long term. But for half of these people, the passing time job has turned into a lifetime occupation. This speaks volume to the lack of alternatives, the failure of the Tanzanian economy to create jobs. And the second point is there is indeed some degree of occupational mobility, but we shouldn't romanticize as mainstream economics tend to do the picture of informality as a quick gym to learn entrepreneurial skills that you take them somewhere else. This is a very slow pace of occupational mobility. If you take 130 people, no more than three or four every year can move to other things. Stop number six is about phase two, the new phase of neoliberalism, which uh, was announced as imminence uh, as early as in 2002 but it took forever to implement, and it became operational only in 2015, frustratingly when the book was going to press, it, it was starting. Uh, and so bus rapid transit, uh, why do I call them the new face of neoliberalism? Because it is about intervening in a, in a public transportation that has become so congested, as you can see in these photos. And it has become like this because the state has no resources or money to intervene in the regulation of public transport. And after 30 years of this, the World Bank comes in and say, $150 million are available to completely transform the face of public transport in Dar es Salaam. We're gonna double the size of each main arteries in Dar es Salaam on two lanes. These bendy buses, like we have them in London, will operate on exclusive lanes. In the other two lanes, it's gonna be uh, private owners of cars. Why is this the new face of neoliberalism? Again, you ask who owns what in BRT, how has BRT arrived to Dar es Salaam, and you can start seeing quite quickly the way in which uh, the number of BRT, by the way, is growing exponentially in the cities of uh, the south. You know, there were 150 uh, 10 years ago, and they are scheduled to be more, over 300 in the next 10 years. And why is this happening? Because there are a group of very active NGO brokers who knock on the doors of the mayors of almost every main city in Asia and Africa. And they offer packages to go to Bogota to study and learn the flagship project of BRT in Colombia. And these are NGOs that, even if you look at their boards, have a strong representatives of a, a finance, big finance interest. You know, Goldman Sachs, uh, a World Bank former uh, transport advisors are overly represented in the boards of these NGOs. And what's in it for finance is that through BRT, you open up public transport to uh, loans, uh, which of course needs repaying with taxpayer money. So the first thing I do in this chapter is to deconstruct again the case of BRT, which is suggested as this win-win intervention in public transport that is good for the poor, for the economy, for the environment, and instead try to pin down what are the vested interests that push this agenda in such an aggressive and successful way. But the second question is to ask, uh, why has it taken so long to implement a project that uh, really took nearly 14 years to see the light. 
And the story that I try to follow is that the story of a Tanzanian interest that uh, had a lot to lose from the introduction of BRT, the Dala Dala owners, the workers, the state caught in between because there are legitimacy issues in opening up this sector to owners that by default, given the size of the investment, would be foreign. So the BRT project gets caught up in some very interesting nationalist politics where the government is very unsure on the one hand is committing to the work on the project, is getting the loans running. On the other hand, is very cautious not to uh, make worse off a number of pre-existing actors that uh, uh, are well rooted in Tanzanian society. And uh, we, we conclude by looking at the, the way in which political economy helps us to understand the shape of the project uh, once it was finally launched, a project that uh, was looking very different from the way in which it was planned by the advocates of BRT. Why was it different? Because when they announced the fairs of BRT, remember this is a very poor country uh, and a very poor city with lots of poor people in it, BRT fares would have involved a more than 50% increase in public transport. And you can imagine the outcry about realizing that this cheap and pro poor project would have been actually a 50% increase in public transport. So the, what the government did was to allow Dalla Dalla owners to operate in competition uh, and in parallel to uh, BRT. So that on my last visit, I was in Dar es Salaam, uh, two weeks ago, you could see, I've never seen social inequality so obviously in buses. So you have two buses. One, if you can afford 650 shillings, you board a bus that operates on exclusive lane, and in 25 minutes it takes you 15 kilometers uh, at the other hand. If you can't afford that, you pay 400 shillings, so less than 50%, and uh, you get stuck for one and a half hours in very old and polluting and the unsafe buses. So the, the tragedy is that scarce resource, i.e. public funding, is being earmarked to serve the loan for a project that is unfit for being pro poor. Final stop, this guy is saying we are also human. And I agree, there is a, a desperate need of uh, bringing real living people at the center of the studies of cities and informal economies. People that are uh, very often displaced, in my opinion, by both the post-colonial narrative and the mainstream economics narrative on informality. Ordinary cities are actually extraordinary cities. Uh, I think they are cities of ghosts because you have this uh, amorphous urban poor, people at the grassroots, the everyday, a number of uh, murky concepts in which all you know is that these people are unhinged from the material, the economic, which are, as we know, central aspects of everyday life. So there is a, a post-colonial incapacity or lack of interest in pinning down materiality, which of course has serious implication on the capacity to imagine a radical intervention. Because when it gets real, you can't use very effectively concepts such as people as infrastructure, of the generative powers of the everyday in any meaningful way. So in some post-colonial emphasis on the agency and creative virtues of the poor is seriously misleading in that it lacks attention to the economic and political structure in which the poor are located. And so for me, rescuing the humanity of the poor was about giving voice space to the tragedy of the lives and careers of these people. This is Dotto, a life spent filling buses in Dar es Salaam, say, any man with a sound brain knows that shouting a destination and pulling people into a bus is not a joke. We do it because we are in trouble. And then I think he says a very important thing, cleverness without results is pointless. And this is where so much writing on urban Africa and informal economy gets it wrong, mistaking the heroic efforts to make ends meet in an impossible situation with a capacity to shape the reality out there that poor people simply do not easily command. Even more grim story from another guy. I can't put the photo because this guy is an alcoholist. It was 10 a.m. when I interviewed him and he was already drunk. We sit here, we talk, a life of trouble, deep trouble. You sit with hunger and you see me today. I haven't got a bus or anything else. 
This guy is in Dar, his family and kids are in Tanga, a few hundred miles away. He's stuck. I can't go and visit when things are not are going well. How can I go when I haven't got even the money for breakfast? I will have to go and see them with enough money, not with 10,000 shillings. So you need a job, 100,000 shillings at least to go there. The money for the bus ticket to and from Tanga, clothes from my parents and family, and enough money to use while I'm there. How can you get this money without work? We live like birds. Actually, a bird is better off as he knows that he will eat. There is no way out. So there was a, a serious disconnect between the, the bitter disappointment and despondency of these guys and what I was reading as a theoretical entry point of my work. So Peter says is worried that we shouldn't see material deprivation as the only lens through which we understand cities in the South. My concern is the opposite. It's about this flow or romantic, unsubstantiated celebration of the everyday. And why am I concerned? Because I think these narratives that become so hegemonic are systematically crowding out an understanding of the concrete realities ordinary urban residents actually face, and therefore uh, crowding out a study of the possibility for overcoming the challenges of their lives. The second and final point I want to make is that instead of this romance about high agency, historically and empirically grounded political economy remains the best approach at our disposal. Uh, it does a great job for opening the door to accounting for empirical deference, complexity, but without falling into extreme relativism, as much of the scholarship I was talking about does. So we go back to this original question, what defines the urban experience in Africa in contrast to other parts of the world. And I would say, to cut a long story short, that we do need to do prior conceptual work and also a lot more of empirics than much of the literature does. But the key points are that different levels of capitalist development do matter because they result in marked differences about the level of economic growth and, of course, the urban outcomes and urban possibilities. How do you abstract from different levels of capitalist development? So in sum, what we do need to do to take structure and agency more seriously is to have a contextualized understanding of urban capitalism. And that today means the study of neoliberalism, its tension and contestations, of which taken for a ride wants to be a contribution. I stop at that. Thank you. I think Alana has some brief comments and questions, and then we'll open it up. Okay, thank you very much. And it's um, hard to follow Matteo's um, act, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, as was mentioned before, I'm from the International Transport Workers Federation, which is a global union federation in the transport industry. At the moment, we have over 700 trade unions affiliated to us, representing about 19 million transport workers. And it's been absolutely brilliant working um, and getting to know Matteo um, and his research, because all his knowledge and analysis has a very direct and concrete relevance to the campaigning, bargaining, um, and um, yeah, organizing strategies of trade unions. So we've been able to make available some of the ideas that he's developed in his book um, to the members and leaders of the trade unions that are affiliated to us. And one of my dreams is that we'll find a way of developing some popular worker education material based on the research um, that is written up um, in the book. Um, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to make a few comments linked to the two questions that I want to ask um, Matteo. Um, the one is related to the vision that we try to develop um, in the trade union movement for public transport. Um, so I want to situate the book in the wider context of the crisis in public transport in most developing cities around the world. We know that there's increasing urbanization 
and that public transport is not expanding fast enough to meet the mobility needs of um, the populations of most developing cities. We know there's terrible congestion. We saw the photograph that Matteo showed us. And we also know that there hasn't been a significant modal shift from private cars to public transport in line with what the science tells us is required in order to address climate change. So transport is the one sector where emissions are still rising. So I think the question that I have, Matteo, is given this crisis and the need to um, address mobility needs, does your book run the risk of resisting interventions like BRT, which is attempting to address this crisis without proposing a compelling alternative? Um, and I ask that question because these are some of the questions that we ourselves as trade unions are having to address. Um, the second question I've got is that I think the book has so many strengths, but the one strength that really stood out for me is the very detailed focus on um, labour issues. And I think what I really loved about the book is that Matteo does not speak on behalf of workers through the many interviews that you've done and the hours of listening to workers in their own language, they really speak for themselves um, in the book. And much of what we've heard from the transport workers in Dar es Salaam is also true for you know, transport workers in many other cities. It's common kind of problems and issues and challenges. So, and, sorry, and we also know that BRT is faced by many of those workers. So my question is, what would you say are the most significant lessons for workers' struggles in other countries um, for public transport, um, you know, drawing on the findings of your book? Thank you, Alana. Great questions. Uh, so let's start with the second one. So what can we learn from Tanzania uh, from workers' struggles elsewhere? Is he on? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the, the 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 events that I, I analyze and uh, describe in the book are context specific, and they are also open ended. You know, there there is a lot of uh, uh, struggles that you don't know until you see the end how they're gonna pan out. So. The starting point has to be they are not the findings are not rep replicable, but you can draw some important, I think, general considerations about uh, workers' possibility elsewhere. So I would say there are three aspects that uh, one can uh, generalize a, a, about. The first one is about trade union and informals. What's the relationship between trade union? And informals, how can you best lay a relationship that is likely to generate a strong uh, workers' action? And I think for me, uh, they are about <coughs> process. You know, these are very slowly developing uh, partnerships. So the, the informals and the transport worker federation spent basically the first two and a half years just getting to know each other. You know, I have all this correspondence, which is fascinating, where the Daladala worker chairman is uh, writing a long letter about the economics of work in Daladala. What does it mean to be a Daladala worker? And at the same time, the transport worker is educating uh, the, the worker association leaders about how do you maneuver uh, the Tanzanian state bureaucracy. So there is a, a process of uh, uh, knowing each other that uh, doesn't easily fit with the time frames of mm -hmm. uh, a development aid project that impose unrealistic three, four years timeline. So that, that's the first thing, you know, it, it took the best part of three, four years to, to get the ball rolling and then nearly a decade of uh, mobilization in different ways that I try to mm -hmm. describe in the book. Uh, the second one is that workers, the, the informal workers' leadership is central to the, in the process of organization, is central to the chances of, of success. You know, these were, uh, workers that uh, kick-started the association of the workers and uh, they were then told you need to approach the transport trade union for a set of bureaucratic reasons but throughout the process they did maintain some uh, considerable level of leadership in the process so mm -hmm. that the, the, 
the lesson for, for unions would be you don't easily go and organize areas where it, 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 there's not a strong enough uh, movement before trade unions to build upon. And I think also, uh, to be fair to unions, uh, Co2T, the, the formal transport trade union, is investing resources, facilitating the organization of these workers. And that is important because there is a lot of literature that suggests that unions are not interested or very cynical in organizing informals. That might be the case in many instances, but there is also genuine case studies of trying to break new ground mm -hmm. to respond to important changes and challenges in the labor market. So that's the first one. Let's not overgeneralize. The second one is again, as I was saying in the conclusion, methodological, class-based, political economy is central to make sense of the relationship with trade unions and informals. Too often you read so much of the writing about informality where you don't get shown who owns what, who does what, mm. and yet we are pontificating on why the informal traders behave politically the way they do. I think I'm all for mm. pinning down the basics of uh, who owns what and the materiality and how this opens up the door to understanding the political interests of people in the process. And related to that, uh, political economy does allow to locate workers in these economic and political uh, structures and by no means is functionalist by definition. You know, it is posing these questions if you're serious about field work really leaves you with a lot of work to do to understand what is actually going on. And finally, uh, uh, the, the, the generalization that you can get from this uh, case study on organizing the informal economy is that its findings sits at odds and challenge very influential writing and development studies about uh, the fact that rights of work and organizing at the workplace belong to the past. So here I have in mind mm. the work of a very important and in many ways progressive guys like Guy Standing mm. or James Ferguson. They push a basic income or universal uh, basic income grant on the basis that the complexity of labor market and the invisibility of employers makes workplace struggles very unlikely to succeed. Mm -hmm. I would say instead, let's look at different sectors, different degree of powers by different uh, type of workers. And, what, and even that doesn't tell you the whole story because then you need to understand how political power is claimed through organization. But I would say, Let's not celebrate the funeral of mm. organized labor when there is so much new forms of labor organizing uh, uh, taking place. So that's the first one. Going to BRT, uh, given the urgency of addressing mobility needs, uh, do we run the risk of resisting intervention like BRT? Uh, two things I would say here. One is uh, what ITF is also trying to do, to get in early with BRT mm. is fundamental because BRT, when, by the time the buses are running, you can do very little as, a, as an organization to uh, defend the workers from job losses. So getting early in the negotiation process, uh, like you guys are trying to do in Nairobi, can open the door for more meaningful uh, gains in uh, uh, resisting the impacts of BRT. But deep inside, for me, you can quote me on this, but BRT is a scam mm. because it's advocated as this financially self-sufficient, pro-poor, public transport intervention that is good for the environment as well. Once you see it, every time after it starts operating, it becomes clear that it needs subsidies to be sustainable. It does frame out of the, this improved public transport the poor, who of course cannot even consider a 50% increase in, mm. in fares. And it distorts uh, the use of taxpayer money. So I often ask myself, why is Tanzania, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, needs to have buses that are so high tech? Yeah. Which of course means that infrastructure will cost a lot more because it needs to tolerate the tonnage of this high tech infrastructure. So I would say the challenge for unions and for people who want to resist BRT and not buy this win-win narrative that comes with BRT is to how do you develop alternatives? Because the problem is what is the, the capacity for unions or scholars on their own to develop 
credible and fully costed alternative to BRT. No, it, it requires a lot of effort and money. But I think what I have in mind is why can't you put forward programs to help existing owners to capitalize uh, and have uh, less hold, less polluting, and perhaps link this to better labor standards, which will resolve, of course, the issue of poor provision of public transport. But these are issues that are completely ignored. Mm. And uh, I think the response has to be when people start saying, what's your alternative? I say, Let, let's build this alternative to get, let's create fund, f space and funds to study this alternative. And uh, as the first step is, let's look in a more honest uh, way at the, the many problems that BRT implementations comes with. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Ananda. Thanks, Matteo. Um, just a small footnote that the, 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 uh, the framing of BRT, Bus Rapid Transport, which Matteo discusses very well in the book, is that its primary vehicle in terms of finance is public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that in itself raises a whole number of problematic issues which should perhaps be kept separate from the environmental gains uh, that, that, that uh, evidently come from effective public transport systems that reduce private car ownership uh, uh, and so on. Um, I mean, I, when, I, when I read the book, I was just thinking about this country all the time, um, because I have a, a, a generation that um, remembers this person called Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and um, Margaret Thatcher had an absolute hatred of the railways, mm -hmm. uh, which, which seemed, it seemed irrational at the time. It seemed even more irrational in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And one of the objectives of her period in office was to move freight off the railways onto Britain's roads. And a lot of problems of Britain's roads are because of, you know, that, 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 um, that displacement of, of freight traffic mm. from the railways to ra Why did she ha hate railways so much? Because, well, my own guess is that, is that railways are kind of intrinsically public goods. Mm. <coughs> they privatise the railways with pretty disastrous results mm. as well as moving freight from rail to road in this very small country we inhabit with, with massive social costs. Anyway, that's my little... Uh, so um, now we're open for questions, comments, further issues which, uh, which can be to Matteo or, or uh, some to Anand if they're specifically on uh, trade union issues of um, of transport. Yeah, uh, behind you, the first one. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. I really, I read your book. I really enjoyed how you tried to not create an amorphous urban poor and really allow people to speak on their own behalf. Um, I'm just wondering, I know you, when you finish writing this book, it sort of leaves off at a certain time of the BRT project and there's a certain compromise that's worked out between the government and dollar dollar workers. Um, I'm wondering on your most recent trip what you learned from the contacts that you've been talking to about this compromise and how it's being negotiated with the dollar dollar workers mm -hmm. with BRT, you know, in November 2017. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Um, do you want to follow up? Thank you very much, Matteo, for, uh, for your talk. That's very interesting. When he, he, um, Henry said that you were very well known amongst the transport workers, I thought you'd actually been caught many times travelling without paying your fare. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question actually is, uh, no. is serious. I better declare my lack of credentials. I don't know anything about uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania or East uh, Africa, so my question may be very, very naive. Um, in one of the photographs you showed, I inferred that about 40% of the traffic 
uh, was not in fact a, a bus but privately owned and I was wondering is there a means by which um, I mean, I don't know people who own their own uh, vehicles, how much richer they are than the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the general poor people who are travelling on the buses referring to. Is there a means by which it would be possible to introduce uh, congestion charging? You have people who are collecting the tolls that would create employment. And if you um, can facilitate public transport, you know, covering fair distances in a short time, is there a means by which that would generate more employment? Because you've got the in infrastructure, there might be more entrepreneurs setting up their businesses and then creating more um, employment. But I, do, I don't know whether that would fit in the context of Tanzania. I'm completely ignorant, I admit that. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Great questions. Um, on the compromise, so at the moment you have a situation where, um, first of all, when the project was first launched, the World Bank was very aggressively saying, whoever operates this system will let it be decided by market and market credential. We can't interfere with this, we're going to make investors run away. But and that whoever gets to operate the system needs to have a previous track record, which of course cut out Tanzanians from ownership of the project, but that creates political pressures on uh, the leadership that was meant to intervene to unlock this situation. And at this particular time, also Tanzanian politics are very rapidly changing, so that Magufuli, as you know, is the new president that came in in 2015, one of his key uh, political capitals and slogans is to protect Tanzanians' interests from this dumping by foreign company and from patterns of uh, the regulation that leads to very little poverty reduction. So what happened is that uh, the project reached a standstill where the infrastructure was ready but there were no buses because the World Bank and the Tanzanian government could not agree on who was to operate. As a compromise, UDA, which was the former public sector company, was privatized, and then the rumor is, is the son of the president behind it. But UDA starts ordering, uh, this is a Tanzanian company, hundreds of buses without the permission of BRT, and then they say, we are going to operate BRT. The World Bank had a major panic about this, because A, they weren't ordering the right buses, but B, because they wanted more efficient and larger operators to operate this. Now it seems that the Tanzanian ownership of the project is there to stay because whoever will do win the not interim tender but the, the, the long term when you get 20 years of revenue will have to put in place a credible plan to incorporate the pre-existing UDA in this. But this is not enough for UDA. We say we don't need anyone from outside. We're going to run it, just Tanzanians ourselves. So. Basically, what's happening now is that the project is caught up in this nationalist politics. But also, there is the biggest issue, uh, uh, this issue of fares, because 650 shillings was not acceptable to the public, and that led to the uh, allowing of Dala Dala to operate in parallel, which was not in the plans. But that kills a lot of the revenue of BRT, so that... Uh, BRT is saying in this way, after one year, we're going to go bust. But the minute you ask for subsidies, Dalla Dalla starts saying, hey, we have operated 30 years without subsidies. You put the fees up and you want no subsidies as well. So it's a very explosive situation in which uh, it depends who will prevail. But these are the kind of uh, drivers of the politics. Access of the poor is not there, requirement of subsidies and the foreign versus domestic ownership. Your point yeah, is very interesting. The photo you spoke to the key issue, that the key source of congestion in Dar es Salaam is that the use of 4x4 four four with one or two people in it. Mm. You know, you're talking about more than 100,000 cars on the streets every day, as opposed to 7,000 uh, minibuses. So it's interesting how BRT targets the displacement of 7,000 and does nothing about congestion charge. 
And I think when you are talking about intervention that at the end of the life of BRT will have cost more than $1 billion, everything is possible in terms of technological change. But the problem is congestion charge is quite a soft intervention. Mm. You know, you put all the technology and the digitalization is important, but you don't need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to redo the streets. And therefore, finance is not so angry about congestion charges because it doesn't create one billion dollars of revenue and the loans that find the market right so I think it's a very interesting question yours but the, the answer is solutions to public transport problem problems don't get decided on the basis of a common good It's more that we move from a situation of lack of interventions because there was no funding available to a situation where a certain cartel has been very successful in pinning down the Tanzanian state to a loan that has now 150 million to be paid back and now phase two is being constructed. That's the, the game. The TR have a franchise which will end what, in 10 years or something like that? Yeah, but they have now invested in an infrastructure that is designed the roads to carry oh, these right. buses. You know, when you get to the stop, it opens, aligned with the station, is designed as a full package. Mm -hmm that cost a lot of money because of all these complexities. Yeah, the, the, uh, the BRT project that Matteo describes in the book does involve a lot of road building in the city because there are going to be these dedicated lanes for the, uh, for, for the buses as well as smart cards and all kinds of other accoutrements of civilization. Um, no no queuing, no no job collecting money on the buses. Yeah. Whatever. It's all gonna be smart car. Okay, other questions. Uh, right. One, two, three. We can at the back first, yeah. Abari Zajuni, yeah, from across the border in Nairobi. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask because um, I've done some interesting work with Matatus in Nairobi and I wanted to ask if you've looked at the incentive structures around the Dalla Dalla industry in Tanzania because one thing we found was, um, for example, asking why do Matatu drivers drive so badly and we thought it was a cultural behavioral issue and it was it wasn't. It turns out that they are pushed to do this by the owners of the, of the vans themselves. And then when you ask the van owners why you're pushing the drivers to do this, they say, I've taken out a loan at 18%. I have to have this thing make as much money as it can. So there's this incentive structure that flows down, which then drives behavior, <laughs> not, not the other way around. And, and that probably, and, and I was wondering if you looked at that in, in relation to the Dalla Dalla industry. And then secondly, just on the question of solutions, have you looked at, you know, complementary solutions? So one of the things we looked at was, for example, a trunk railway line in Nairobi to take traffic off the major roads, which is where you get the major traffic, but to keep Matatus to do the point-to-point -point transport because that's what they're really good at while they're terrible on the highways. And so those sorts of integrated solutions where you do have to build some infrastructure, but at the same time, you keep what the existing industry is very, very good at. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Uh, thank you, Matteo. Uh, so this is, I mean, you've already said maybe a few of the things I wanted to ask. Uh, but having spent, I mean, I've spent about the last six to seven years trying to oppose BRT projects in Lahore, Pakistan through discourse and other kinds of sort of interventions. And one of the sort of bizarre things which you just sort of pointed out is that they're willing to spend billions to get rid of these 7,000 uh, vehicles instead of the others. So in Lahore, sort of the po policy framework is ridiculous. So one, you have the building of BRTs and on the other side, you have the building of signal-free corridors. Signal-free corridors. I mean, I don't know if you understand what they are, but these are sort of pro-car. So existing roads are being converted into signal-free roads to encourage cars. So on one side, we have uh, these bus rapid transit 
projects being developed. On the other side, we have the signal-free corridors, which are actually designed for making car transport uh, more efficient uh, being designed. So it's this sort of bizarre situation where actually BRTs aren't solving, uh, creating sort of public transport for all. They're actually sort of creating sort of this intervention within labor transport regimes. Uh, and even within that, a peculiarly sort of ridiculous one, given subsidies and the involvement of foreign capital. Uh, but the other question I sort of had was, uh, so you did sort of say, and I appreciate the theoretical interventions, but I also think that maybe they also come up with their own sort of problems, or at least in terms of opening it up. So this idea of chaos, for example, and you said, sure, there is a level of dysfunction within uh, Dar es Salaam, there's a level of function within Lahore, for example. Uh, but in a sense, this is part of the discourse that justifies the BRT intervention, right? So when we say oh, public transport is chaotic and the middle class or upper, upper classes sort of say, oh, public transport is chaotic, we can't use it. Therefore, you need something like the BRT to come in. When even after the BRT comes in, this class only use it, uses it as a tourist sort of site. So, I mean, my family will go there as this, you know, oh, we got on the BRT once in five years and it's some tourist experience. Uh, but what in Lahore happened is when the BRT was introduced over a 27 kilometer route, five or six other forms of public transport that served the same route were actually banned. So they actually, the competition angle was completely eliminated. Uh, and, and, and the question for me is when we sort of use this chaos discourse, does it not sort of allow or open up our cities to sort of external intervention designed for the entry of foreign capital? Uh, and, and, and how do we sort of resist those projects without fetishizing these form of labor practices? So also not fet fantasizing or fetishizing the existing modes of public transport. Thank you. Thank you. Is someone over here? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matteo. Um, you said that like 300 more BRC projects are planned throughout the world. And uh, what well, we just heard, his criticism, I wondered like how mainstream is BRC criticism becoming? And how likely do you see change happening and also if you can point to some cities where, which you think are doing something different and doing it very well. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think I'll invite uh, yeah. Matteo to respond. Yeah. So the, the incentives questions, I, I, I did look, as I explained in my presentation, at the uh, employer-employee relationship and as these triggers, uh, these incentives to a provision of public transport that is uh, safe and uh, comfortable for passengers because these guys need to uh, run and overload the vehicle as a matter of fact if they need, if they want to have a chance to get some daily return from work at the end of the day. Uh, your point about owners saying I have taken out a loan I need to repay it. Um, it's fascinating how even two countries across the border, the, how different it is. So for instance, studying owners of Dala Dala is very difficult to access them. Uh, you don't have uh, companies, you, you, you need to basically word of mouth get them. But the existing studies that we do have point to the fact that personal savings as opposed to loans are a key source of uh, uh, money to buy the bus. So, uh, it, repayments of loans is not such a driver of the incentives to my owners. But in any case, uh, what is problematic about this story is that workers already have stretched the working day to the very end. It's not that uh, the owners, it, for me the incentives works that the owners knows uh, that workers have no bargaining power on a one-to-one -one basis to negotiate on how much money they want to be taken back to them every day. And so they push this fee up, very up, and is consistently the same fee across uh, the sector, depending on the age of the car or the size of the car. Other than that, they know that in this way they will get, you know, it's a, it's a quite interesting arrangement because basically it's a type of work where 
the amount that you bring to the owner at the end of the day is known. Whether workers will get anything back is unknown. So owners, after they put this arrangement in place, can sit back and wait for their FT sum at the end of each day to be delivered. If not, they will uh, forgive them maybe for one day or two after which they will proceed to finding another fresh, uh, maybe driver and conductor. Uh, on the integrated solutions, again, you know, one thing I learned by studying public transport in details is how political the decisions about solutions to public transport are. So uh, I really shy away from saying what could I do if I was the mayor of Dar es Salaam, what are the technological choices that allow us to uh, have a better public transport system, because it is blatantly the case that uh, where big changes are coming because of uh, very big players in international development who are pushing a, an agenda uh, without much consideration to what the alternatives might be. And that's why challenging BRT narratives becomes important because you wouldn't know that there are such significant problems with BRT if you read 95, 99% of the existing literature. And this is not a small literature, by the way. Laore, I didn't know that you were <laughs> responding to BRT. Uh, I, I, I was talking about chaos as the, the post-colonial disagreement about cities as chaos. Uh, to me, uh, it is correct and important to uh, report how dysfunctional the situation has become in public transport. There's no denying that some degree of uh, intervention needs to take place. Uh, and I don't think this uh, opens the, the door to BRT interventions because there could be other solutions to this crisis, which is a crisis, that could be uh, elaborated and invested upon. But the problem is, again, about monopoly over ideas. At the moment, there is this lobby that has captured the funding, mm -hmm. Uh, of uh, the key players, the eyes of most mayor, you know, the, the, the trips of mayor from cities in Af Asia and Africa to Bogota, you're talking about over 100 mayors who are taken executive flight, nice accommodation to see how beautiful Bogota Transmillennium is. From that, they take you to Washington to talk to the World Bank, and that's how they open up this thing. So, for me, we need to continue uh, calling it a chaos because this is what it is, but that doesn't necessarily open the door to that fix as an intervention. Uh, BRT, other BRT that works better, uh, the flagship, let's start, the flagship of BRT is in Bogota, in Colombia, uh, and again, uh, some of the issues that uh, I was uh, describing about Dar es Salaam are also visible there. Uh, I think, you know, the, 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 the politics and the implementation of BRT might and will differ a lot of context by context, but the tension that it generates are, uh, as far as I can tell from review of literatures, quite uh, endemic, so to speak. Mm. And what are they? Now, they come as a package, which is a PPP, as Henry was, public-private partnership, and there you have already, from the outset, a very powerful asymmetries between what is the capacity of a public sector part of the partnership to negotiate and bargain over the contracts, the revenue guarantee clause that get negotiated very early in the life of the project, vis-a-vis uh, -vis mega transport companies that have been rolling this project time and place. So I'll give you this example about Dar es Salaam. Once the, the, the government doesn't have the guts to frame out the Daladalas from the, the route, it means they are taking away shares of the market from BRT. But BRT will complain and say, hey, you gave me an idea that I was going to get 100% of the market, now I'm getting 50%. And there will be a contract with a, a revenue clause that means this is at the loss of the taxpayer because the government will have to subsidize the revenue. So I think that is a, a structural tension. BRT are advertised as something that is self-sufficient once you do the infrastructure. They very rarely are. BRT requires some increases in fare levels 
and as a result they exclude the poor from public transport. The concentration of ownership of public transport is reduced to a handful of uh, big companies or families, like in the case of Bogota. Mm. So uh, the politics of these uh, issues will vary from context to context, but it's not surprising the way it's set up, the BRT results in these problems. They are structural characteristics of the project that we are dealing and talking about. Hi, Matteo. Um, it's really interesting that most of the questions are focusing on BRT. And if you want a topic for your next book, there it is. But I think this story, this narrative that you're weaving is about the people in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and you've said a couple of times about how saturated their working lives are, 16 hours a day, 6.7 days a week. But knowing some of those lives as I do as well, I know that these people have got second income streams and third income streams and fourth income streams mm -hmm. going on at the same time. There's layers of the informal economy going throughout this narrative as well. Mm -hmm. Do you look at that in the book and mm -hmm. what's your thoughts about that? I mean, I know drivers who get up at four <coughs> to do two hours work shift uh, at the abattoir before getting in the bus and driving a 16 hour day. Um, thank, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on the resonance of Tanzania's experience of socialism for the labour movement today. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to spend some time in Tanzania over the summer and um, when I came home my parents asked me if they had any sort of words that I'd learned in Kiswahili and they sort of laughed when Mapinduzi was the first one that I said, which means revolution. Um, because it's some of the, lots of the conversations that I had with people in uh, Dar es Salaam, particularly one outside a bookshop for quite a, quite a few hours, we spoke quite a long time about Nerere and there was quite a complex and sincere attachment to him as well as like an excitement about talking about lots of other African freedom fighters that we came up in the conversation. So I guess my question is like whether there's a sort of strand in the union organizing or movement that sort of self-consciously conceives of itself within this radical tradition and what sort of impact that continues to have. Yeah. Now, your question, other income streams. The, the, my, my sense, you know, first of all, remember, stop number five is about tracing where people go from here, right? And so, uh, in terms of long-term outcome from this kind of activities, uh, there is a disturbing picture about 50% being stuck, the other 40% uh, moving to other transport-related jobs, uh, together with the burnout. In my instance, I ask quite a lot whether there was more on the side in addition to, to, to this. And uh, they seem to be talking about a work that uh, is the only activity that they rely upon. And the problem is, if you get a good win and uh, you get three, four days where the car is functioning, the police doesn't disturb you, you can also accumulate some uh, small money that might trigger other activities, but systematically, you say, because it's so easy to lose the job, uh, you are on the, ba the bench relying for these two, three hours of work and uh, eating away your small capital. So I, I don't have a sense of these people who are, they are stuck in this bus with the exception of two, three hours and they're not chasing other ventures. They are just recovering f ready for the next six, seven hours. Uh, those who are chronically on the bench are more maybe moving, but they are just uh, spraying themselves very thin with those all sorts of uh, micro survival activities. But I don't get this sense of. Otherwise, I would say they would move on to other things after a while, and they don't. Yeah. Uh, is there any resonance of Tanzanian socialism in the, the, the way unions behave? Uh, in the effort by workers to claim for employment contracts, labor rights, uh, socialism 
and the values of public ownership and of treating workers fairly is used uh, endlessly in the letters uh, to authorities, in the letter between the association of workers and the trade union itself. So, uh, and that's why, uh, as I was uh, explaining in my talk, I found this literature on post-socialism quite revealing because at the end of the day, Tanzania fully turned its back to socialism, but the, the, the moral power and influence of Nyerere has never vanished. And that's why today, with this new presidency, it's quite interesting how he's really pushing back the, the role of the state. But this might have uh, uh, disturbing implications for workers and the unions because uh, it seems more like uh, the developmental authoritarianism that Magufuli is trying to bring in place and that, as we know from other contexts, might well result in a crushing of organized labor activities and all the, the effort will be on accumulating, on industrialization, on building sustainable factories. Yeah, I was putting my hand up several times. Okay, a bit of a provocation to have a bit of fun. Um, so, an important part of your story is also methodological. You gave us your, your take on how self employment and wage employment is defined, and indeed, the representation of people at the workplace is crucial to understand also collective action. So, if I put my mask of the Soto and I say, well, that owner of the car is actually a rentier who's charging a rent for these vehicle assets, and these guys are just self-employed heroes who pay, so hiring this car, yeah. and then trying to make a living out of it. What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. um, what, how would you respond to that? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just saying this, because this, is not, this is not just a pedantic methodological discussion with, when we get lost in semantics. So just think about the contradictions in how delivery workers and Uber drivers have been uh, defined in recent court cases. Mm -hmm. Exactly, very similar type of employment relationship, mm -hmm. but completely, two completely different outcomes. Mm -hmm. no, no, Thank you, Carlos. Okay, I think two more, and that will probably be it. Yeah. Uh, one at the back. Yeah. And then, well, we, yeah, we can go next. Yeah. Hi, Matteo. Thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, we've We've heard a lot about this incentive structure in terms of dollar dollar drivers having to pay um, a daily amount to owners. Uh, and it seems like a very simplistic, and I'm sure this is discussed in your book, which I haven't read yet. Um, surely that kind of incentive structure, a simple solution would be to invert that incentive structure, whereby owners would actually pay drivers a set amount per day. It's called a wage in, in other language. Um, <laughs> Old-fashioned. <laughs> yeah. Old-fashioned, I know. I mean, obviously, that would change the, the risk, the, the uncertainty and the risk would be placed on the owners rather than the workers. Um, but I'd, I'd like to hear from you a bit of, uh, is, is there a debate around changing the kind of employment regulations in the sector to, as a kind of short-term fix? Um, yeah. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. It was uh, very interesting. Um, it's kind of, uh, my question is a unification of a couple that have come before already, actually. Uh, mainly linked into your point that you said you wanted to study why in particular, uh, this particular moment, at this particular moment, uh, this informal sector chose to unionize or to come to an association in the way that it did. And again, it might be covered in your book, so apologies if I'm asking for spoilers in that regard. Uh, but. I would wonder if you could comment on that, uh, and also how you might see uh, this association developing uh, in the future, um, particularly with regard to other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, such as South Africa recently, where an informal sector in the form of taxi seems to have acquired quite a lot of uh, political power in recent years, as emblemized by uh, recent strikes. Um, so if you could comment on that, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, starting with the, the Soto, uh, they are technically, if you say, are you, they are renting the car, but they are renting the car because employers take advantage of their power in the labor market 
to deprive these workers even of the status of being a worker so that they don't know who is working for them. And so I agree, these are not pedantic issues and we need to strip to the bone. Okay, self-employment must have some degree of uh, uh, entrepreneurship <coughs> attached to it. In this particular case, is not the case. And I think what it becomes then crucial is to look at how these guys, even including Uber, Deliveroo, see themselves. What is interesting is when these guys do manage to organize, they first step is what do we want when do we write to the union and say we want employment contracts. Yeah. So they are, if you want to call them rentier, you can, but they are people that operate buses so which they don't own even a sticker and when they do organize they ask we want to end this fiction that we don't work for this, we want employment contracts. So that is linked to, to uh, Kevin's question about is there a regulation, uh, a debate about employment regulation. This is all, by the way, discussed in the book and uh, when they do organize, they start putting pressure on the regulator. You know, there was the starting point is the Tanzanian state doesn't know and doesn't want to know who operates these buses. If I own a bus, I go do the vehicle inspection, I show that I paid income tax and I get my license. But following it, years of uh, wildcat strikes, protests that could not be too confrontational but nonetheless significant enough to turn the heat on the state to regulate, into, uh, act as a diplomat between the two parties. Uh, regulation have changed so that if you want to get given a license to operate as a public transport private operators, you need to bring as part of your documentation the contracts of the workers. So these are all victories of these guys, slowly but surely. Of course you can bring your cousins uh, with a contract. No, these are of course doctoring the contracts, but as the union, and this in the book, says, for us it means that the, the, the room for maneuvers for people who want to bypass labor regulation is getting smaller and smaller, because the day this guy my worker is caught on the bus and the contract, we look at the contract and it is his cousin, this guy is going to end up in labor court. And the union is picking up on this and much of their work is to defend workers in court because they had a contract but it was put aside. So there has been a key target of the organizing to change the incentive structure. They got some legal victories, as you know, legal victory is one thing, victory in the real world is another, but the step is not small because the room for cheating and uh, uh, bypassing labor regulation is really formally shrunk. Uh, why did they organize at that particular point and where is this going? The organization, you know, it, it, is, it is a fascinating, you know, we, we all experience that. We get stuck with the same problem sometimes a spark that leads us to do something different. The story was that one worker was involved in a serious accident, the owner disowned it, said you deal with it. The workers were forced of course to emergency collection of money to get this guy out of jail. And then four or five of them say okay we don't continue this on a hard hoc basis, we want to start an association. And from that, you know, this is all uh, explained and analyzed in uh, chapter five, there is a long journey that takes three years to the formal registration of the association and that gets involved in these struggles that I was explaining to Kevin. So where is this going? Although the formal trade union and the association have a, a, a good partnership that leads to uh, achievable results, it is full of tensions as well because the informals feel that they have become a branch, they are paying some fees they don't get any weight within the union that is dominated by aviation workers, you know, railway workers. So this is the classic story of the informals that might be organized, but how do you change the power within a union that involves many formal sector story? It's not an easy story. So after two, three years, the, the informals exited the union and started their own trade union, so not an association. The association has now given life to Tarwotu, which is road workers, Tanzania Road Workers Union. 
So on the one hand, this is disturbing because the, the labor movement is fragmented and that allows room for employers or BRT to manipulate things. But on the other hand, on the, as an offshoot of this partnership, you have now an informal workers' union, formally registered and fully controlled by the workers themselves. And so when BRT really hits the fan and uh, it starts really phasing out all the daladalas, what you will see, I think, is that COTUT, which is the formal sector transport union, will be quite happy about BRT because these are big companies, it's easier to organize, uh, much easier than daladala owners, while Tarwoto, which is the informal workers' union, will be concerned about the loss of 20,000 jobs, which are their constituency. So union politics will play themselves out like this, I think. Okay, um, thanks Matteo, um, except as you and the Dalla Dalla workers point out, again whether one calls this a job is, <laughs> is exactly part of the much more widespread series of issues about work and employment and income and survival uh, and capitalism today. I'd like to thank everybody here for very good questions and observations, to thank Matteo, to thank Alana, and perhaps to urge Matteo to rush out to sign any <laughs> copies of the book for those who want to read further. Some of the very good questions are in fact questions that the material in the mm. book uh, do does cover. So thank you all and uh, thank you. Thanks for coming.